So we are in the introductory material to the book of Genesis, and uh, I'd ask you to open up your Bibles, except we're not quite there yet, um, although we've been throwing scripture throughout all of this to, to kind of prove the points that we're making. I just wanted to back up a little bit to uh, this slide just to, to kind of remind us what we're talking about. Uh, last week we talked about the idea that Gen the book of Genesis is foundational, uh, not only to uh, our faith, but to Christianity in its in the uh, in the in the, the extreme. <clears throat> if you can discount the book of Genesis, you can discount quite a bit, and I'll, I'll get to that. And and this is just one of the ones that I, one of the little pictures I showed up there. I wanted to actually get back to this this slide here. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, as sin entered the world and death through sin, thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. For, this, uh, for until the law was in the world, but sin was... Am I not reading? I'm not reading very well. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed <clears throat> when there is no law. Nevertheless, Death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. And the point that I was making with Romans chapter uh, 5 here is, is that Paul, when he wrote that, he was writing about a real person, a real event, real happenings that happen. And the reason that, that all of that uh, shines forward is because we've got... Uh, the book of Genesis, chapter 1, chapter 2, all the way through chapter 12, which some people discount, uh, or sorry, chapter 11, some people discount as, as fiction or myth or whatever, but they're real, and the rest of the Bible corroborates that. The rest of the Bible says that this is real stuff that really happened. Uh, and it, it, it's the reason I, brought, I wanted to go back to that slide is because I wanted to start with this quote again. Uh, this is a man named uh, G.R. Bozarth, and he's writing in The American Atheist in September of 1978. So that's how old this quote is. But this quote encapsulates the understanding that the, uh, the people who fight against the Bible, who fight against the book of Genesis as being literal history, um, this is their understanding. And they understand it better than a lot of Christians do. And if you read it with me, it says, Christianity has fought and still fights and will fight science. And that's actually not true. It's not science that we're fighting. Uh, to the desperate end over evolution. Because evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. Destroy Adam and Eve and original sin. And in the rubble you will find the sorry remains of the Son of God. If Jesus is not the Redeemer who died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. Um, this is a very powerful quote, and one of the reasons why I put it in there, and you need to understand that this is, I, I, don't, I don't want to say the lot, this is what the, the intelligentsia, or you know, the people who push forward evolution and, and humanism and all of that, they don't believe in God, but they understand the problem. They understand that if you can get rid of Adam and Eve, if you can get rid of the sin that Adam and Eve committed and brought sin and death into the world, if you can discount the book of Genesis, then you can discount the very reason that Jesus Christ came to save us from our, from our sins. Because if that didn't happen, if the Genesis, if Adam and Eve and the fall didn't happen, then Jesus is a lie. And that's their point here. And, and don't misunderstand that. That's the reason, that's, and I want to emphasize this again. This guy, Bozarth, has a better understanding of the importance of Genesis than many Christians do. Um, out of, because some of the foundational things we get out of, of the book of Genesis uh, is the origin of sin. We get death for sin, suffering for sin, separation from God for sin. Marriage uh, ends up here in chapter 2. Uh, clothing. Uh, in chapter in chapter two three, accountability authority uh, that man is made in the image of God, those all come out of the the those are all very foundational ideas that come out of the book of Genesis. Now this guy this next quote uh, is from a guy named Jeremy Rifkin, and he's an uh, American. I'm going to read this American 
economic and social theorist. I said is, he was, because he's dead now. Um, and uh, uh, he's the author, he was the author of 22 books about this, the impact of scientific and technological changes on the economy, the workforce, society, and the environment. And he also spoke a lot about religion. Um, I find this, this quote actually kind of blasphemous, <laughs> um, but you need to understand, this is how humanists think. This is how uh, a, lot of people, a lot of people think. He says, we no longer feel ourselves to be guests in someone else's home. And what he's saying there is, is that if God created the world, then he owns it, and he understands that. But because he doesn't believe in God, he says, we don't have to be a guest in someone else's home. We can do what we want. And, and that's what he goes on to say. He says, uh, and therefore obliged to make our behavior conform with a set of pre-existing cosmic rules. It is our creation now. We make the rules. We establish the parameters of reality. We create the world. And because we do, we no longer feel beholden to outside forces. We no longer have to justify our behavior, for we are now the architects of the universe. Um, <laughs> the arrogance that this guy portrays here, the architects of the universe, um, like he was out there and, and said one day, let there be light, and there was light. Um, that he designed the way that the human body works. That he knows the, the you know, when, when you get to the book of Job and, and God says, were you there when I, when I opened the fountains of the deep? Or were you there when I laid the, the you know, the, 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 the sky out? Were you... And Job, what was Job's proper response was, no, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to say anything. Um, he goes on, we no longer have to justify our behavior, for we are now the architect of the universe. We are responsible to nothing outside ourselves, for we are the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Uh, and then he goes on to, to uh, kind of throw a little bit of the Lord's Prayer right in there. The point of this is, is that uh, this guy is a humanist. This guy doesn't believe in God. And this is the stuff that you guys have to, that you may come up against when you're talking about your belief in a God, your belief in the book of Genesis. But this is the attitude of people that, that are outside of the Bible. Terry, you had a comment? Yes. <clears throat> this guy, the um, confusion of this. Yeah. Because he says we are responsible. He's saying that as a collective. If we're not responsible to anything, it's every man for himself. Every well, exactly. man does his own. See, that's, that's the, the interesting, interesting thing about humanism. And, and this guy, is it, when he says we here, he really means all of humanity. He means mankind. And, and the humanist manifesto, the, the idea of, of what the humanists believe, is that humanity is the pinnacle of creation. We are, we are the best there is. Um, now that may be true uh, because that's the way God intended it, but that's not the way they believe. And you're exactly right. In fact, what you find out is you find out that people in power, uh, and all you have to do is go to recent headlines with guys like Jeffrey Epstein and all the stuff that went on in his private island and stuff like that, and the people who went to his private island, the people in power with wealth and all of that, they think exactly this way, that, that they can do whatever they want and there's no one who can stop them. And it's okay, because they have, they have, uh, are you doing that? Uh, am I doing it? Am I hitting my mic? I'm sorry, sorry. Um, uh, they think that they have the, the, the wealth and the, uh, the ability to get away with it. I did not do that. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Um, uh, yeah, follow on. Go ahead. Uh, when I'm sitting here looking at this, is this, it's the same chaos you see in evolution. Because they, they have the thought, oh, it's just going to go down a trail to human beings. Where everything that's cre <clears throat> that would evolve would fraction to another evolution. And it's the same chaos in their thinking. You're um, right. You're right. Every human being's going to fracture to its own under their logic. Yeah, it's, it's whatever I think is best uh, for me. And, and it, it really, the only reason that we have laws about not murdering and stuff like that is because that's what society wants. It's not really, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, so Mike, you had a comment? 
Yeah, this is all, you know, great theoretical garbage, but, uh, <laughs> you know, in human experience, even among those who espouse these things, ultimately feel some sense of responsibility and some uh, framework that they really need to conform to. Um, you know, even, even those who've committed horrendous crimes, they may, they may suppress their, their feelings of guilt, but they're still there. And, and, you know, so the human experience doesn't match up with what Except this Except that we know that the conscience can be seared as with a hot iron, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and just like uh, Paul said in Romans, they, they suppress the truth, you know, mm -hmm. right. in unrighteousness. Right. Don, you had a comment? Yeah, when, when people like this guy here can start creating life and creating a universe and start changing laws, say, of uh, like thermodynamics, then I might start listening to them. Oh, exactly. And, and that's kind of the, what I was trying to indicate earlier, Don. Excellent point. Um, and it's, it's interesting. It's not just people uh, that are outside the world. Some Christians kind of have not quite this extreme of a, of a belief, uh, but they have, they have some. But this is like, a, in my notes, I've got this is typical um, humanist doctrine. This man is the pinnacle of evolution. I said all that. Um, one would expect an atheist to discount Genesis. However, uh, most of those who call themselves Christians uh, also deny the literal telling of Genesis. Um, he understands, uh, this is actually talking about, I, I've got my notes missed up here a little bit, sorry. Um, I want to go on to this next guy. His name is George Wald. He's a Nobel Prize winning uh, biologist. Uh, in fact, it, what's interesting is this, he's a Nobel Prize winning, he won the Nobel Prize for uh, talking about things that had to do with the eye. And as Bill pointed out in his class on, the, uh, on uh, intelligent design, there's really no way you can look at the eye and understand that the eye was not designed. And, but listen to this. This is, this is another, uh, I, I love this quote because this really helps you understand how many evolutionists believe. Um, again, he understands this. Uh, one has to only contemplate the magnitude of this task to concede that spontaneous generation of a living organism is impossible. Yet here we are as a result, I believe, of spontaneous generation. Louis Pasteur, uh, the guy who created pasteurization, the guy who is uh, really responsible for a lot of uh, stuff in, in, in uh, uh, molecular biology and stuff like that, he proved that spontaneous generation was not possible. Wald knows this. <laughs> he says, it's impossible. And yet here we are as a result of spontaneous generation. Now, the co the, there's a word for that. It's called two words, cognitive dissonance. Yes. And I don't understand how you could understand that something is impossible, that, but yet we're here because of that. That's faith. It's literally faith. Uh, his next comment is, there are only two possibilities as to how life began. Spontaneous generation or a supernatural act of God. Spontaneous generation was disproved in the last century by Pasteur, uh, which leaves the only choice as being the supernatural act of God. I will not accept that philosophically because I do not choose to believe in God. Therefore, I choose to believe in that which I know is impossible. This is, this is how you almost have to... There's so much evidence for intelligent design. So much evidence for, uh, and that's outside of, outside of the Bible. In fact, intelligent design has con converted more scientists to the idea that there is a God than anything else. And, uh, but Dr. Wald here, um, who has also passed on to the great beyond and to his judgment, uh, says, I choose not to believe in God. Therefore, I choose to believe in something that is not possible uh, to base my faith on. And again, that's faith. Evolutionists have faith because it's a religion. Bill. Yeah, it's not the evidence that keeps people from believing that God made everything. <clears throat> it's, it's the will. It's that they will not believe. They will, they choose, just like this man, I, I choose not to accept that. And so basically it's, it's rebellion against something that is obvious, should be obvious to everyone. And uh, that's, that's sad, but 
you know, made, God has made it so clear, right? Right. That he, that he made everything. Right. And, Romans and, chapter one. and it's just, it's just out and out rebellion who God will judge those who rebel against him. And, and this is really, this is just pointing it out. He chooses not to believe in God. Right. You had a comment? And yeah, I, I, I think it's almost a disparagement of the word faith to equate this to faith. Because faith is the evidence of things not seen. You know, the conviction of uh, and so on. And he has no evidence. He, he has no evidence to believe this. I, I call it blindness, you know. Um, <laughs> Blind faith. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a paradoxic yeah. or a contradiction of terms. There is no such thing as blind faith. It, it's, it's either something that we choose to believe in because mm -hmm. of evidence that we have seen or, or not. But anyway, that's, that's just my thought. And, and uh, I, I think that when one makes the choice to believe in God and to, to pursue the understanding of the world in, the, in light of that, uh, that actually enlightens the brain. What this man has done <laughs> actually uh, turns the brain off and says, okay, mm -hmm. my brain can't go beyond here. And, you know. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Um, so uh, I'm going to get to the, to the, my main point today is going to talk about evolution briefly uh, and the problems with it. Um, but what I wanted to point out now is, is that evolution is everywhere. Um, this is a, a textbook that you can go buy on Amazon. In fact, I just did a screenshot of the table of contents. Actually, this is the first chapter in the book. Uh, this is World History, Culture, States, and Societies of 1500. So if you look at any world history book, they don't just start with the cradle of civilization, which is the, the Fertile Crescent, Mesopotamia, and all that. They don't always, they, they, they want to get, they, they say, well, this is what came before that. And if you look, just right, you've got eight, uh, eight to six million years ago, uh, bipedal hominids in Africa. That's where you've got Leakey looking for Lucy and, and uh, Australopithecus and, and all of those, all those proto-humans, supposedly. Uh, and, and so right in the book there, I mean, it, this is teaching evolution. Um, any world history book that you pick up, uh, whether it's a college level one, a high school level one, None of them have anything but that. Uh, when, remember when I told you that if you ever see the word, the, the, the abbreviation BCE, you know you're talking about someone who doesn't believe in Christianity, doesn't believe in Christ, because that's before the common era. Uh, and so you've got, again, you've got dates in here. This is, it, it's all around us. It's, it's in TV shows, it's in uh, movies, it's in books, it's in uh, anything you can think of. Evolution has a part in it. Um, I, I'm a, I love Star Trek uh, as a TV show. But Star Trek teaches divergent evolution. They teach that we all evolved in, in one way. Actually, they teach not only that, they teach uh, panspermia or the, the alien concept. Because there was actually one of the episodes where it shows that the Romulans and the Klingons and the humans and all were seated by an alien from uh, an alien culture from some time way back in the past. You know, I love it, but it still teaches something that I don't believe in. Um, so uh, it's all around us. And, and, and so I wonder, uh, we're bombarded by it. Uh, but to accept evolution is to deny Christ. I, I just, that's my belief. If you accept what evolution is, then you're denying the, the sanctity of the Bible. You're denying the book of Genesis, uh, going back to what Bozarth was saying. So um, part of the problem with, uh, part of the problem with, oh, this is another part of that book. Uh, part of the problem is that um, we're presented with this idea that the earth is really old. You can't talk to anyone without, the, I, talk, without them outside of the church, without them thinking that the earth, the earth is four to five billion years old. And there's all this evidence for it, supposedly. And, uh, and I'm going to talk about, one, talk about a number of different things uh, today, the problems with some of those things. Um, the evidence doesn't necessarily uh, support uh, a, a five billion year old or four and a half billion year old earth. Things could have happened that would change what happened to the earth. Something like a global flood. 
uh, and no one takes that into account. You'll go into a textbook that has geology in it and you'll see this thing called the geologic column. And it goes back in time to the Paleolithic and the Mesolithic and the Jurassic and you know, all these different things. And it's nice laid out. And these are the layers. And this is how sediment and erosion and put all these things down. We find all these fossils in these layers and all of that. The only problem with that is, is that that doesn't exist anywhere in the world. Amen. It doesn't exist in the world. And yet it's taught as fact. How many of you, when you were going to school, saw the little drawing in your book with the, the thing that looked like a horse? And I don't, I don't have a picture of it, but it looked like a horse. And then there was an intermediate thing. And then there was a horse. And it talks about evolution and how this is. They've never found, they've never found an intermediate transitionary uh, fossil ever. They have not found one. And yet, and, and so that comes up with, so you have the hopeful monster theory. You have all these different things. Uh, Gary, um, uh, Terry has a comment. Uh, uh, oh, you saw that in your textbook. Yeah, I grew up with all those things. It's been happening for 50, 60 years. Uh, all of us, whether, all of us that are, and most of us are older in here for some reason, <laughs> we, were, we were bombarded with that stuff uh, all through our lives. And uh, I don't know, did you guys, Bailey, did you guys see that in your textbook? Yeah, see, they, it's still there. And it's been proven false for years. That that little horse thing was not the precursor of the modern horse. It's, it's false, and yet it still ends up in biology textbooks. Mike. There was a, uh, a conference a number of years ago, and I, I'm just making general references because I, I, I don't have the specific... But apparently there was all of these evolutionists that had come together and were discussing over the period of time uh, what they knew about evolution. And finally, when one of the speakers was up in front and he said, okay, so can anyone state clearly something we know about evolution? And, uh, and one gentleman raised his hand and said, uh, although I believe in it, it ought not to be taught in our high schools and, and schools, you know, that basically he recognized that there was not sufficient uh, scientific evidence to, sure. to support these things. So the problem, the problem was, again, is, is that we're presented with this, this, this huge age of the earth, and yet the Bible says that the earth was created in six days. And that if you look at the Bible, the Bible suggests, I think, that the earth is, is less than 10,000 years old. And so you've got this contradiction. And again, we're bombarded with all this science or pseudoscience or whatever that says the earth is really old and yet here, so, some, so there's, there, what ends up happening is, is you end up having people who want to be, have, the, have their feet in both worlds. And if you believe that the earth is four and a half billion years old, uh, I think that you can justify that and still believe in scripture, but only in a little way. <laughs> you have to believe that God created the world old, uh, that he created the universe old. Um, that's not what I believe, but uh, what I believe isn't necessarily the, the point of this class. Um, but what ends up happening is you have a compromise uh, between what you believe as a Christian and what you think uh, in science. And this guy, head of the Catholic Church, not this guy, not currently, but the one before, Pope John Paul II, um, he, had a, he gave a speech in 1986. And he was talking about the first chapter of Genesis. And he, it, the bolded part here, you don't have to read the whole thing, but he says, indeed, the theory of natural evolution understood in a sense that does not exclude divine causality is not in principle opposed to the truth about creation of the visible world as presented in the book of Genesis. What he's saying is just that you can believe in evolution as long as you think that God guided it. Uh, theistic evolution. And I will show you in a little bit why that should be an, another anathema thing to us. Um, that to, because what you're doing here is you're compromising with this idea of evolution. As a Christian, you can, look at, you can look at the Bible and say, this is what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say anything about this. And we'll talk about day age. We'll talk about gap theory. We'll talk about a couple of those things. If, I, think we'll get, I think we'll get through them. <laughs> um, We'll talk about those briefly, but all of those things are, are a way of compromising Christianity with 
uh, with this. Uh, according to the hypothesis m mentioned, it is, it is possible that the human body, following the order impressed by the Creator on the energies of life, could have been gradually prepared in the forms of antecedent living beings. Paul, John Paul here is saying, yeah, there, there could have been evolution from the ape to, the, to a human being and with all those hominids in between, in between. And it's only, and I, have a, I had a cartoon of this, it's only when you get to the, the top of it and, he, and Adam and Eve that he finally says, okay, now there, I've created them in my image. That's like blasphemy to me. Um, the, idea that, the idea that God slowly made this stuff happen over millions and millions, billions of years, uh, that's creative energy. Be, to me, it's just, it's just a, a, a nonsense fiction. Theistic evolution. This is the head of the Catholic Church saying that, yeah, that's possible. You don't have to exclude any of that. So, uh, I don't know if, you know, most Catholics don't believe what the Pope says anyway, but uh, <laughs> I don't know how many of them actually believe this. I don't know how many in Christianity believe the idea of theistic evolution, but I, I'm here to tell you that that's, that's wrong. Uh, and I'll, I'll show, I showed a picture, it was a cartoon a while ago, uh, but I'll show why um, uh, a little bit later on, I think. Um, This is Asa Gray again. I talked to him. He's he's dead, long dead. But uh, Yale Divinity School. He was a he was a preacher, uh, a teacher, a professor. Uh, we may take it to be accepted uh, to be the accepted idea that mosaic books were not handed down to us for our instruction and in scientific knowledge. That's actually a true statement. Genesis was not handed to us as a science book. However. And the Bible was not handed to us for a science book. Have you ever gone and looked at the, the idea? It wasn't until the 1800s that uh, someone was, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but he was sick and he was reading his Bible and it talked about the paths of the... Uh, Maori. Maori? -A yeah, Maori, thank you. Um, uh, the, the, it says the paths of the sea. And you know what he did? He thought, huh, that's interesting. And he went out and found the paths of the sea. He found currents and he said, all this stuff that's, that, that the Bible talked about thousands of years before, and, and it wasn't until the 1800s. What about the condensation cycle? The Bible talks about that, how the rain comes down on the mountains and goes down the rivers, goes out into the ocean, is evaporated and goes up into the clouds again. Where it comes. That's talked about in the Bible, and yet it wasn't until the 1800s again that someone figured, figured out that's what was actually happening. When the Bible deals with science. The Bible is correct. Is Genesis a book of science? No. It is not. But let me ask you a question. If God said that this is the way the things happened, are you going to give some credit to that idea? I'm going to. So if this opposes some of those other scientific ideas, then I'm going to go with what I understand Scripture to be. Um, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, and if, if the Bible employs a certain statement, be it a scientific statement, in order to uphold a, a spiritual truth, and if that scientific statement isn't true, then the spiritual, then the spiritual truth, truth isn't true. So, right. I mean, the implication is that it's using true statements to uphold right. spiritual truth. Right. I want you to go back and think about... Uh, uh, George Wald for a second, and think of him as being the guy in the statue here. Um, we have a problem as a society of, and maybe not as much now as we did 20, 30 years ago, of venerating the man in the white coat, the man in the lab coat, as an unbiased uh, person just searching for the truth. And that is rarely the case. Uh, and, and oftentimes they know the truth and they don't publish the truth uh, because they'll lose tenure, they'll lose their funding, they'll lose you know, their, their way of life, they'll, they'll get ostracized and all that. And so they don't tell the truth. Um, and, and the little blurb there, in case you can't read it, it says the, at the base of the statue, the man in the white coat, coat, entirely unbiased, completely objective in his search for scientific truth. Um, 
So when an expert comes out and says that, like George Wald, you know, that evolution is what I believe in, um, if you suppose if he found any shred of evidence that discounted the idea of evolution, that he would publish that or go down that theory, he's not, he's not unbiased. We all bring our biases to us. I bring my bias to, the, to this class. You, I hope you bring your bias to this class. We all bring biases to life. It's how we function. And to think that we can do this and just objectively search for the truth uh, the, the, you know, in this way, it, it's, it's, it's a myth. And uh, so we need to keep that, in, uh, keep that kind of idea in mind uh, that they are fallible, um, they, are, they are biased, um, and it's just the way it is. Um, I've got a couple more quotes here that I want to get to. Um, Uh, this is from the book, Is God a Creationist? And this guy believes that God is not a creationist. I believe that God is a creationist. <laughs> I do. I believe I, I'm, a, I'm a creationist. I believe that, that God created the world in six days and, and uh, six literal days even. Um, this guy says, The scriptures do not require us to believe in six 24-hour days of creation. There's legitimate internal Bible evidence to indicate that the days of creation may have been an indefinite periods of time. Um, not if you understand Bible hermeneutics. Not if you understand <laughs> uh, Mike's class on Bible skills. Uh, there is not legitimate evidence for that. Um, moreover, the genealogies of Genesis 5 and 11 need not be taken in a rigidly literal fashion. I've already shown you why you should take them in a rigidly literal fashion. Because Luke takes them in a rigidly literal fashion when he's talking about the, the, the birth of Christ. Uh, Christians also need to realize that accepting the universi universality of the flood hardly requires one to adopt. Flood geology is the only possible explanation. Moreover, it is not entirely clear that the Bible is talking about a geographically universal flood. This person has not read Genesis chapter 6, 7, 8, or 9. He has not read them. Um, and, and in fact, when you get to the get to the promise that God makes about the rainbow, uh, uh, that, that that that's not localized flooding he's talking about here. Uh, and, and in fact, I think I have a I do have a cartoon about that. Um, uh, and this guy is quoting from Genesis chapter nine. He says, "Look at that beautiful rainbow. It's a promise from God that He'll never again flood the entire earth as He did in Noah's day." And uh, he says, my college professor, my Christian college professor, said that Noah's flood didn't cover the entire earth. Um, he says, he told you it was just localized flood? That's what he said. So that's what this means, right? <laughs> so he believes that God promised never to send a localized flood. Have you heard of any flooding lately? <laughs> Every year there's flooding. Every year there's a rainbow. So either you have a misunderstanding <laughs> on the part of the person who thinks that God was talking about localized flooding, or God is a liar. There's, there's only two choices there. Uh, Genesis chapter 9, uh, verses 12 through 16. I'm going to just read 15 here. I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. Does that sound like a localized flood to you? No, God is making a promise. That's why he gave us the rainbow, that when he sees that rainbow, he'll remember, yeah, I said I wasn't going to flood the whole world. I can just kind of picture him saying that. I said I made a promise. I'm not going to flood the whole world. Next time he's going to use fire. Second Peter, chapter 3. Um, so anyway, you, you, you've got... I, I look at some of these understandings, these, some of these ideas, and it just... It just uh, floors me. Uh, let, let me go on, though. Uh, what is popularly believed? Uh, see, do I have that highlighted? Uh, this is, again, from God. Is God a creationist? Um, what has been popularly believed by Christians is not necessarily what the Bible teaches. That's actually a true statement. Uh, a lot of people believe that you can go to heaven based on faith only. That's a popular belief. It's not based on Bible it's not based on what the Bible teaches. What he's talking about here is the book of Genesis. 
you know, uh, six literal days, uh, the flood, the Tower of Babel, all of that. He says, you don't have to believe that. That's not what this, that's not necessarily what it teaches. Uh, there are sound exegetical grounds for maintaining that the six days of creation were long, indeterminate periods of time. Um, this interpretation also uh, long ago suggested by Augustine and other church, church follow, uh, fathers. Augustine's not necessarily a church father, but he does play a, a big role in, in uh, Christianity uh, as far as the spread of it and stuff like that. So what this guy is saying is, is that Augustine believed that they were long periods of time. And my response to that is, so... <laughs> I don't care if Augustine believed that. Augustine wasn't right on the virgin birth. Augustine wasn't right on the assumption of Mary. Augustine wasn't right on original sin. Uh, Augustine wasn't right on a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but, you know, the fa what he's saying here is, is that if the church fathers believe it, well, then maybe you should believe it too. Um, we have every right to state that long figurative day interpretation is legitimate, uh, as have been supported by many of the greatest theologians in church history. Um, this is called the day-age theory. Um, uh, just a second, Jay. Uh, the day-age theory, and, and I'm going to talk about this in just a minute. Uh, <laughs> he's trying to get, to, get around you. Um, uh, the, uh, why, that's, why that's got problems. Um, but this author is suggesting that that uh, you know, God's not a creationist because God didn't teach this. Well, God did teach six literal days in the book of Genesis. Uh, Jake, you had a comment? Uh, <clears throat> I do. Th this one, this actually brings up a, one of my favorite topics about this time and days. We today have approximately a 24-hour day. It's a little bit longer than that, but... Mm -hmm. It's based on the earth turning one complete revolution, and there's nothing to keep the earth spinning, and there's nothing to slow it down. It's just it was a top placed in motion, and now it's spinning down. It's slowing down. It's slowing down, it yes. Is. And Things so are longer. if you do simple math, we, about every decade, we time to stand still for us because the earth is slowing down, which our day is getting longer. Uh -huh. And so it's about every 10 years, sometimes it's longer, but it's been in our lifetime for sure that we've had to stand still for one second at midnight for the time for the clocks to catch up. Well, if you do the reverse of that, and it was, it is simply one million years ago based on an evolutionary clock, the earth was spinning so fast that day and night were one second. Now, if you do it every 20 years, it's 2 million years ago, but it's far shorter than the 4 billion whatever. And then if you do the math of our ground speed, our ground speed at a one second day would be 86 million miles an hour, which is pretty quick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't think that would be survivable. And that was just a mere million or two years ago, which is just hilarious to me because I'm thinking, how, how fast were we spinning four billion years ago? Yeah, and, and what he's talking about are called cosmic clocks. And, and I'm going to briefly talk about those in a little bit. But the idea is, is that, the, that we look at something that you can measure right now, um, and, and that actually is, one, is a great cosmic clock. Because uh, the Earth, you can show that the Earth is slowing down. You can show that it's not going as fast, and that it and that it was going faster in the past, and that the rate is fairly steady. That's what a clock is. You've got something that happens over a period of time. You can divide it into periods of time. That's what a clock is, and that clock is shows that if you go back far enough in time, that it makes life on Earth impossible. When they said that there was life on Earth. Um, and, and so, so you're great. Uh, what was popularly believed uh, prior to 1900 that the Earth was approximately 6,000 years old. Uh, uh, by 1900, it was 100 million years old, and today it's 4.6 billion years old. Um, again, uh, uh, when, and when he talks about there is sound exege exegetical, uh, I'm not saying that right, I don't think, exe exegetical grounds for maintaining that the six days of creation were long, interminate periods of time. 
They're going to two scriptures for that. Psalm 90 verse 4 says, For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it, was, uh, when it is past, and like a watch in the night. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 8 says, But beloved, do not forget this, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years. And they never finish that statement. And a thousand years is one day. So they go to these and say, well, here you've got God representing in the Bible that a thousand years is one day. So we can automatically, in the six days of creation, we can add 70,000 years. Which, <laughs> in evolutionary time frame, is nothing. So adding 7,000 years isn't going to do anything. Long periods of time. So uh, Mike has a comment, Gary. Uh, so uh, again, there's really not sound, ed, uh, sound for the, uh, exe exegetical grounds for this. And we'll, we'll again talk about that a little bit. Um, uh, what I want to talk to you about now is cosmic clocks. So as a good, good lead in there, Jake. Uh, Mike. Just real quickly on the on the time thing where to the Lord days a thousand years, thousand years a day. Of course, the meaning of that is that time is insignificant to God because he's Correct. eternal. But I'm sorry. I people that. use it, even some believers that I know use that to try to prove theistic evolution. But look what the text says. It says to the Lord days a thousand years, not to man. So when Joshua and Israel marched around Jericho for seven days, how, how long was that? Was that seven thousand years <laughs> or was that seven little days i mean the text alone identifies who that's speaking to man yeah. one day is one day right and and uh, anyway thought i'd throw that in no excellent point and and i meant to make that point is just that that um that what uh second peter three uh what it says a thousand years is the lord it's talking about the the, the god is outside of time and it's and he can wait a thousand years to do something uh, if he wants and it's just like a day to him um, that's the meaning of that not to take that and try to apply it to creation um, uh, the problem with evolution evolution has a problem and that problem is time there's never enough time and not only that that time seems to work against them uh, in ways that they don't like um, this idea here, uniformitarianism, uniformitarianism, is this, this idea of the rock strata, where it, um, I'm being told I'm running out of time, uh, where uh, you've got all these layers of rock and, and uh, that they were laid down over time. And what, basically what it means is, is that geologists will say, well, this layer of rock here, the bottom one, that was created over a period of time because what we can do is we can calculate how much, uh, how much sediment is being laid down over time. And um, the pro there's a really big problem with any cosmic clock. Uh, and again, what a clock is, is that if you picture this, picture a measuring cup full of water and uh, a cup on the bottom. And out of that measuring cup comes a drip every second. Can you calculate? Can you calculate how much water is going to be in that in that cup on the bottom uh, over a period of time? Yes, you can. Can you calculate how long that drip has been going uh, by knowing the volume of the water in the bottom cup? Yes, you can. If you walk in and see that, what don't you know? You when it started. <laughs> how much water was in the bottom cup when it started, whether the rate of the water dripping has changed over time, uh, whether or not someone added a bunch of water to the bottom cup when you weren't looking. So when you come in, and this is what human beings do, in our lifetime we come in and we say, wow, there's cosmic dust falling at a certain rate, and we can calculate that certain rate, and this is a real story, um, we can calculate that, that dust falling at a certain rate, and we can determine how thick that dust should be. They did this in the 60s. They were afraid that when they landed on the moon, that the lunar, the lunar lander would sink into the ground because there, were, there should have been feet of cosmic dust. So this is, what they were, this is their assumption, that the moon had no dust on it when it was created, 
that they could determine how much cosmic dust was falling on the earth and the moon in the vicinity, because we're in the same vicinity, over time, and that uh, if, those two, if those two things are true, there should have been a huge amount of cosmic dust on the moon. When they got there, so they actually made a design change of the lunar lander. They put these big saucer-like feet on the lunar lander so that when it landed, it wouldn't sink into the dust. And when they got there, there was a half an inch of dust. There wasn't very much dust at all. Now, it's since been proven that they had bad measurements to begin with. But that's how a cosmic clock works. You look at something like the, the fact that, that the Earth is slowing down uh, a second every 10 years, and you start going backwards. Eventually, if it keeps the same rate going forwards, the Earth is going to stop turning. In how many years? I don't know. Millions of years? I don't know. Um, if you, that's what a cosmic clock is. And the problem with all cosmic clocks are what I just stated. You're coming in right here into, a, into a, a, a point in time in the clock. You don't know when the clock started. You don't know if the rate is the same. And in that is a big one. You don't know if the rate of, of cosmic dust falling was greater in the past uh, or will be greater in the future. You don't know any of that. All you can do is measure what you see. And basing a cosmic clock on measuring something over 10 years or 20 years or 130 years or something like that, measuring a cosmic clock based on that type of, of, of uh, experimentation and knowledge and data and all that is actually kind of foolish. Now, I will say one thing is, is that that not only goes for evolutionists, it goes for creationists too. You don't want to depend your, your whole argument on the idea of this. Now, uniformitarianism, it, the idea is, is that we see changes. Water erosion, we see wind erosion, freezing, thawing, chemical changes, glaciers, all that. It leaves out two things. Well, one thing. It, it, it leaves out the flood. A person who believes, is, uh, and the person, I, what was his name? Uh, I've got it in my notes. Um, his name was uh, James Hutton. He said, the present is the key to the past. What we see now is the key to how old things are. And I'm out of time, so we'll have to finish this up here. Uh, but what he's saying is, is that, that if, you can view, if you can view what's happening now, you can see what happened in the past. And they always leave out something like someone coming in and adding water to the cup when they weren't looking, like the flood. They always leave that out. The flood made massive changes to the earth. Massive, massive changes to the earth. And so uh, um, when you start looking at stuff like this, that's great in theory. There's no way to prove it. Um, and in fact, the flood, actually lately, the flood has had some big, uh, big uh, Mount St. Helens uh, showed that flood geology is a real thing. Uh, and they've been able to study the, the canyon that Mount St. Helens made uh, and say, well, yeah, <laughs> the Grand Canyon could have done that. Uh, so we'll talk about more about that. Uh, let's, let's just end with this, this idea of cosmic clocks here. Mark Twain said, in the space of 176 years, the lower Mississippi has shortened itself 242 miles. That is an average of a trifle over a mile and a third per year. Therefore, any calm person who is not blind or idiotic can see that in the old Olithic Solarian period just a million years ago next November, the lower Mississippi River was upwards of 1,300,000 miles long and stuck out of the Gulf of Mexico like a fishing rod. 742 years from now, the lower Mississippi will be only a mile and three quarters long and Cairo and New Orleans will have joined their streets together. That's what's wrong with cosmic clocks. <laughs> because the Mississippi's not getting any shorter like that. But, but anyway, uh, you, you get the idea. So next time we'll, uh, we'll, get into, uh, uh, we'll get into some monkeys and typewriters and uh, some, other, some other problems with time. And then we'll get into the text. I promise next time. I am sorry, but next time.